Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your faithfulness. Your mercy endures forever. You have never failed us. You have never let us down. You have never forsaken us. But you have lifted us up out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. And as we get into your word today, God, I pray that we would be changed from the inside out for your glory, for your kingdom, and for the good of your creation. And you'll get all the praise because you're worthy in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone says, come on, give God a praise this morning. We thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Well, I want to share a message with you this morning that I'm calling, Whom Shall I Fear? I feel like this is super appropriate. We just came out of two and a half years of fear funk. Um, I want you to know as your pastor that, that the whole COVID thing and the whole uh, virus thing didn't scare me a bunch. As a Jesus follower, we don't allow the things of the world, whether it's a virus, a disease, a mandate, uh, a government uh, guideline or whatever it is, we don't allow those things to, to distract us from, from being faithful to the word of God. The enemy is roaming around seeking whom he may devour. People who aren't consuming the word of God and they just go along with it. And we saw a ton of churches, a ton of pastors, a ton of people who call themselves Jesus followers fall away from the standard of the word of God, the simple standard of of assembling together. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And what happened? The cure or the response, the, 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 what do you call that? The response of, of those in leadership in our world, not just our, our city, state, uh, country, but the world, the, their response was actually more detrimental and more harmful. And we just heard Fauci say it online. He, he, not online, but on TV. They knew, they knew that it was going to be detrimental to the economy and to the children. And what happened? We don't, I'm only using that example to say that we don't allow these things that seem wise to the world to supersede the wisdom of our God. Because every single time you follow the wisdom of man, the wisdom of the world, it always, 100% of the time, leads to death and destruction. It does not help anybody out. Maybe in the, in the short run, we're like, oh, this is actually kind of working. And then you go head on with a wall, and it just doesn't work. But 100% of the time, you fall in line with the standard of God's word. He will lift you up. He will raise you up. If you're dying, he will cause you to come back to life. If you're blind, he will cause your blind eyes to see. If you are someone who's super simple, and maybe don't have the words to say, let me raise my hand. I'm saying me. He will empower you, not with the wisdom of the world, but but with his own wisdom. And he will put on the inside of you just a power that can't be replicated. And you're seeing that before your eyes. Six years in, 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 in motion. My dad passed away, what, six years ago? And when that happened, I was like, Lord... You're going to have to do something miraculous because I knew who I was. I knew what I was capable of, but I needed God's help. And I'm telling you, you are witnesses and, and you are a testimony to me as well, because as God is building me up and God is using me, speaking into me and through me, he's also transforming your lives. Uh, let me just give a testimony. Yesterday, there's a family that goes to this church. Um, that I got to meet with their brother, Jan, Peggy, Teresa, who else? Sue and Mike, their brother, unsaved and, and sick in his body. And I, I had the honor of being able to go to his house and speak with him. And I was so charged up on the, on the whole drive there. I never met the dude in my life, 
I, I text him a couple times to encourage him, but you never know how that kind of stuff is going to pan out. And so I knew that I had to go into that house, into that room with confidence. I knew that I had to go in, in, not with the confidence in my own wisdom or in my own understanding and what I knew, but with the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And with that confidence, that boldness, and that faith, talking to that man, I, can tell, I could tell that he was ripe. He was ready. The Holy Spirit had already been speaking to him. He didn't need religion. He needed to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. He needed a relationship with Jesus, and that's exactly what he got. I, I shared with him the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it was like the whole time. He may be, he may be even watching right now. I, I have no clue. Praise God. As, as, I was, as I was sharing it with him, he was in, in a lot of pain. And he, would, he was just, in t- he just, everything that I said, he was just intent, just listening and consuming and just bringing it on the inside. And I know that his sisters have been praying for him. I know that his family has been lifting him up. And he was ripe, ready for, the, the, the word of God tells us that the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. The people who are willing... The people, not, not the, the Jesus followers, or the, he doesn't say that, he doesn't say those are few. He says the ones who are willing to go out and do the work are few. Not to go share religion with people. Oh, this is how you do it. This is the, the ritual. This, okay, you, you go to church on Sunday, wake up in the morning on, on Monday, and you got to make sure you pray or you're, you're, the rest of your day is going to suck. You know, it's not like that. It's an ongoing relationship. Just imagine if, if I, can, I can just imagine if me and my wife, if Felicia and I had, had a relationship like that. Okay, did we knock that box off? Did we, did we kiss today? Okay, let's guess. No, it's not a ritual. It's not a religion. It's not, it's not our search for God. We already found him. He found us. He pulled us up out of the darkness and into his life. And to his light, and now we're serving him. We're not, we're not serving him to be saved. We're serving him because we are saved. We have been saved. I didn't earn this salvation that I have. But now that I'm saved, I'm going to work. There is some harvest to be harvesting, if that's even a thing. And so I want, I want, I, I want so badly for us as a church to be a beacon of hope. That was one of my first prayers when, when, when I became a pastor. I wrote it down. I want Joy Church to be this beacon of light, this beacon of hope, where people from all, all walks of life, all different smells, all different flavors, all different looks, whatever. I want this place to be a beacon of hope when they go by this place. They know that this place was, was designated and set apart for the work of the Lord. And they know if they want to be saved... They can come to joy, and they're going to receive their salvation through Jesus Christ, not through a church, not through a song, not through a pastor, not through a message. It's not about that, but through a a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, placing their faith in Jesus Christ, understanding that Jesus is the Son of God, and allowing Him and making Him the Lord of your life, and being made brand new, a new creation. Can you say amen? amen? Can you tell I'm excited? I'm excited about this, man. So what are we talking about? We're talking about who shall I fear? I want you to know that I am not afraid. That's what we were talking about, right? How do we get where we got? I want you to know that I'm not afraid of of the enemy. People will, will, after I say something about Satan or the devil, say that he's a big gummy bear. He's he's nothing but just a, a roaring lion. I'll get people coming up to me like kind of sheepishly like, don't you want to be careful about how you talk about the devil? Because he might get you. That's kind of what they're insinuating. And I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. Nothing the enemy has can keep me or can, can, uh, can penetrate through what, what God has already done in my life and what Jesus already accomplished up on that cross and his death, his burial, his resurrection. 1 John 5, 18. If you're taking notes... I wasn't going to start here, but I felt the Spirit leading us here. 
1 John 5, 18. This is for someone here today. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. So to realize that when a church or a denomination or a preacher or whoever it is tries to say after you've been saved that you're still a sinner. Oh, we're nothing but sinners saved by grace. No, you're not. You are a child of God. What does John say here? He says, we know that God's children, someone say God's children, children. do not make a practice of sinning. We are no longer sinners. Sin no longer has dominion over us, but we, through the power of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God that lives in us, we have dominion over sin. We have dominion over death. Even though this body may go into the grave, this spirit will live on forever for the glory of God. Can you say amen? amen? And so notice what he says. We don't make a practice of sinning. For God's Son, Jesus Christ, holds them securely. Oh, he doesn't stop there, but I just I want to pause there for a second to realize that God's not afraid of our funk. He's not afraid of our mess. And even though we may not do it right, we may not look right, we may not say it right, or we may, we may not feel worthy. When we put our faith and our trust in him, he holds us securely, and he will not let you go. You may not, you may not feel like it. You may not feel saved, but that's when you double down and say, Lord, I'm serving you with all my heart. I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. Come hell or high water, I don't care what my situation looks around, uh, looks like around me, but I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to lean into you. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to tempt or, or I don't want to get even close to coming out from underneath the shadow of the almighty Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. So which, which, which insinuates that there's the ability to walk out from underneath the shadow of the Almighty. When we, when we follow the ways or the wisdom of the world or our own wisdom, what we're doing is we're walking in our own strength. And I'm telling you, that's like a lottery. Anything can happen. We, all, we already know the outcome, but the journey to get there to that destruction of your own wisdom, your own strength, your own understanding, man, it can, it, 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 buckle up. But when you're staying under the shadow of the Almighty, that comes with with God's provision, God's protection. If you just imagine a large tree and maybe a storm is passing by, you know that if you stay next to this tree, you're going to stay dry. If it's a sunny day, a hot day, it's going to give you uh, shade. It's going to protect you. And if it's got fruit on the the branches, it's going to provide. It's going to provide for you and supply your needs. And so as long as you stay underneath the shadow of the Almighty, his favor will follow. Notice what he says here in in 1 John 5, the part I was trying to get to. So for God's son holds them securely and the evil one cannot touch them. This is for anyone who, who believes or maybe is scared that you can still be possessed by the devil and be spirit filled by God. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. That's conflict. That's not scripture. The word of God tells us that the evil one cannot touch those who are being held uh, securely by the son of God, Jesus Christ. That's good news. Whom shall I fear? So I'm not afraid of the devil. He's just a big gummy bear with a, with a, with a, with a loud mouth. When, when Jesus, when he, when he died and he was in the grave for three days, I could just imagine Jesus with his, this is not what happened. This is what I'm imagining. Putting his, his foot on the head of Satan, on that old serpent and getting a wrench and pulling out every one of his teeth. And so when he, even if he tried to bite you, he just gum you. He's just a big gummy bear. And to realize that he cannot touch you, we see that in the word of God. 1 John 5, where do we see that at? 5.18. And so, 
knowing that Jesus is our light and the word of God is a a light, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. What a light does, it, it, it illuminates the path where you're walking. So if, if, you, if once you were walking in darkness or if, even if you walk out into the world, it can be dark out there, but the word of God is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path so that, I don't know about you, but when I'm walking in the dark, I don't have confidence. I, I'm, I'm walking, cause, man, because I have walked through the dark with confidence and I hurt myself. And my toe would be hurt for like a week or week and a half. But when you're walking in the darkness, there's no confidence. You're kind of hunched over. You're kind of like feeling just to make sure you're not going to run into anything. But when the light is turned on, you square your shoulders. You can see everything is illuminated. And when it comes to spiritual things, when the light is turned on, the, the plot, the schemes, the tricks, the traps of the enemy are all exposed. That's why when a thief tries to come into your backyard or tries to steal something, when the light goes on, they run like a cockroach running from darkness because they've been exposed. And it's the same thing with the enemy. If we're still walking in our own understanding, in our own wisdom or the wisdom of the world, it's like walking in darkness. And anything the enemy tries to plot against you is going to succeed because you're walking in your own wisdom, your own strength. But when you turn to the Lord, And you allow him to be your strength. You allow him to be your provision. You allow him to be your source. Whatever comes your way, you already see it. You're like, oh, woo, that would have hit me. And so when you become a child of God, God illuminates these things. These things that used to be a mystery. These things that that held you down and held you back. Now all of a sudden, you're able to walk with your your shoulders uh, squared, your your, your head held high. And I want you to see here, whom shall I fear? Can I hear someone say, whom shall I fear? Shall I fear? I'm, I'm basing this off of Proverbs 9.10. I'm not sure if this is going to turn into a, a series. I hope it does. I'm just doing my best to follow the leading of the Lord and what, what we need here at Joy at 825 Sunset in West Sacramento. Proverbs 9 and 10 so whom shall I fear? Are we to, are we to fear uh, the devil? Absolutely not. Are we to fear uh, a virus or a sickness? No. Are we to fear a, a government agency? No. Are we to fear uh, people who might be able to, to hurt our bodies? No. In Proverbs, the, the, the ninth chapter, the 10th verse, King Solomon writes to his son, this proverb, this word of wisdom, He says, fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. You see, you can't have wisdom. There's no starting point for wisdom without first having a fear of the Lord. You see, the wisdom of of the world excludes God and they think that they're wise. We thought we were wise, right? We thought we had it all made, but we came to a point, every single one of us came to a point when we had to realize that, wait a second, this is going to come to an end and I don't have what it takes to get me past this, this end point. When, when this life comes to an end, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. I need some help. And then someone invited you or told you about the gospel of Jesus Christ and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And now that you have that fear of the Lord, King Solomon says that that is the foundation or the beginning of wisdom. You see, the wisdom of the world is temporary. It can only see maybe so as far back as we can, we can go back in history, which is pretty long, I guess, pretty far away. But we can't go any further than where we are right now so we can accumulate all the wisdom of all the men and women from all the way back as far as we can go back in history till the till till right now but anything beyond that we kind of got to wait and that's where the wisdom of of man it begins and it ends but the wisdom of the lord has no beginning and it has no end where would you begin to measure out god's wisdom There's no beginning and there's no end. 
God knows the future just as well as he knows the past. He's already been there. And so when you follow, when you follow the wisdom of man, you get to a certain point and things begin to change. Oh, wait a second. You may not want to stick yourself with this jab thing. Because people are now, we're finding out that people are getting hurt. The wisdom of man. The wisdom of God will, will show you, hey, follow my word. The standard has been here all along. It's nothing new. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'll protect you through whatever, whatever storm you go through. Through whatever, whatever uh, hardship or trial or situation or circumstance you, you're faced with. If you'll trust in me through my word, I'll keep you. That's the wisdom of God. So the fear of the Lord and to realize it's not like a spooky, afraid, scared of God. Like I'm not thinking that God, I'm not, if I, oh man, if I screw up, God's going to bop me over the head. God's not some old guy up, up, up in heaven in some rickety like rocking chair with a cane in his hand ready for us to mess up so he can bop us over the head. But he's a loving father. He's a, he's, a, he's a father who has mercy. The word of God, we see where, where it's said where a, a, an earthly father, if their child or their son or their daughter asks for a loaf of bread, is that father going to hand them a, a poisonous snake? Absolutely not. And then he turns around and says, how much more will our heavenly father, the one who created you on purpose, with a purpose and for a purpose, give you all the things that you want, all the things that you need for this life and the life to come. He's a good father. All throughout the, the, the pandemic, I don't know if you heard the same things that I heard, but there were, there were pastors, churches, people were saying the judgment of God is on the world because of abortion or something, whatever it was, whatever the thing was at the time. And so that, that God is punishing uh, and judgment and wrath is coming on the, on the, the people. And we're not, in, we're, we're not in judgment right now. If we were, we'd all be in trouble. We wouldn't have even had the opportunity to be saved if we were under judgment, but we're under grace. We're not under the law. We're under the grace because of the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. So that when we put our faith in him, we're secure. He's holding us securely. Even in John three seventeen, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he's not going around hurting people. He's going around lifting people up. We, if we want to see the heart of God, we look no further than, than the word of God, Jesus Christ, the son of God. What was he going around doing? Was he slapping people down? He was going around to all the people who were sick and he healed everyone. He was healing people. Eye, blind eyes, people who were crippled their entire lives. He didn't say, oh, shame on you. Your parents really did a number on you. But he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And what happened? They did. We're not under judgment, church. We're under the law of grace right now. There is a day coming. There is a judgment day coming. And I, I, wouldn't, I guess the message wouldn't be complete unless I shared that with you too. Because if I only share with you grace and that we're all good, all dogs go to heaven, then I'm kind of maybe loving you into hell kind of a thing. But I got to share with you that there is a judgment day coming. And if you do not place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you will not make heaven your home. You do, if you do not have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you cannot be a child of God. Where does it say that? Well, let me, let me just share it with you since I said it. Romans chapter eight. He says, Roman, in Rome, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul to the, Rome, the Rome, uh, church in Rome. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. There we go again, right? You are controlled by the spirit or the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God. If you have the spirit of God living where? In you. 
And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living where? In them do not belong to him at all. And so I don't want, I, I don't want anyone's blood on my hands when I stand before God. I, I want to make sure that I, that I share the entirety of the truth of God's word. Because I don't, I don't want to hold you over for a week. And I feel like that's what a lot of pastors are doing. A lot of churches are doing. Especially the big ones. They give you something to hold you over for the week. But by the end of the week, you're, you're, you're running dry. Your, your, your fuel tank is running low. Because you're not learning the word of God. You're not getting it in you. You're not, and you're not... Um, Mixing it with the spirit of God to give you power to overcome. I, w- I want to I be a part of a church where, where you are out laying hands on the sick and they're recovering. They're, they're being healed. I want you to be talking to your family members and they're coming into the, the house of God. I don't, it, it's cool if you do this, but I would, what I would love to see happen is that the first thing you think when you, when you see someone who's unsaved or a loved one, you don't think, man, I wish pastor was here. Uh-huh. But the first thing you would think of is, I'm so glad the spirit of God is living in me because I have everything I need to share with this person my testimony of what God has done in my life yeah. and to lead them to Christ and to bring them to church saved. You can bring them unsaved too, please. But... It'd be awesome. I would love that. What a testimony that God would use you because that's his desire, right? He, he, it's not just a pastor's job. This is, this is like a huddle. If you think of it like a football game, they don't stay in the huddle. And when they leave the huddle, they don't go back to the sidelines. They go onto the field and they, field and they run the play. So after we leave this huddle, what we've been instructed to do. Now we leave the huddle and we go out into the world and we fulfill that plan, that purpose that God has put on our hearts in our lives to to be people who will reconcile others to Christ. To be disciples who are making disciples. And to be creative with it. Whatever line of work that you do. Whatever line of work that you do, you are touching people that that I wouldn't be able to even even though maybe not even know that they even exist. You might be a school teacher, being able to show the love of Christ, the love of God in, in what you do. You may be a mechanic, right? To show the love of God in, in, the, in what you do and how you conduct your business and how you do your work. And when God gives you that open door to share, I don't know what it's going to look like. It's going to look different for everyone. I'm not going to tell you exactly how it's going to play out, but to have that open door and the opportunity that we're not afraid, whom shall I fear? We're not afraid of what the enemy is is conjuring up or what someone might think of me. You see, the fear of the Lord is the foundation. It's the beginning of wisdom. And just like King Solomon sharing with his son, this is what I want to do with my children. This is what I am doing sharing with them the fear of the Lord. You see him out here. And believe it or not, they're a lot further along than I was when I was a child. So watch out, devil. Watch out, world. Uh, My children up here playing instruments and wanting to do it. When I was their age, I was forced to do it. And I'm glad I was, because I wouldn't be here today if I I wasn't. But my son, Lyric and Lucas, and today when I came in to the church, it was just me and I was just preparing for this morning. I, I, I was praying for every seed. I was praying for you. Didn't even know who was going to be here this morning, but I was praying for you. And I was laying my hands on the keyboard. And, and I'm going to do it again. I began to sob before the Lord because my children love the Lord. My children are seeing it in me. They're learning it back there on the other side of that wall about Jesus. They're seeing it in your lives. They're seeing the love of Christ being lived out in your life, in your faithfulness. And the people that they know are going to be here. And they start calling out your names because they remember you. you. You're making an impression on their lives. To realize it doesn't start in our 20s after we've gone through all of our screw-ups and we've gone through all of the, 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 the things of the world. 
they don't have to go through what many of us have put ourselves through. We can train them up in the way that they should go so that when they get to the age of accountability, they'll know what to do. They will fear the Lord and they'll have that wisdom just going with them just like this. What was her name? Audrey, the the high school student starting the Bible club. She was, man, she was, she was, (laughs) how do I want to say that? She said, yeah, I checked out your website and I was checking out your doctrine of faith. I was like, how old are you? So yeah, like everything on there is like right on. Everything like lines up with what we believe. I was like, wow, I want you at my church. I want to put you in front of some teenagers and just have you just talk. Share the love of Christ that, that is oozing out of your life. I, I, I felt the spirit of God. Even when I spoke with her on the phone, I just felt she has a calling on her life. And it's evident. And the thing is that every single one of us have a calling on our lives. But maybe you're not in the place where you're, you've surrendered yet to where it's oozing out of you yet. You know it's there, but you're not using it yet. So it's, 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 it's becoming stale and stagnant. And it doesn't begin to grow until you begin to use it. You begin to put it into practice. How many times have I messed up on this stage? But I, was, I wasn't here because I wanted to do it perfect or because I was afraid of messing up or because I was afraid of what someone was going to say. I'm, I'm here in direct, uh, from a direct order from my God. I'm not doing it because of, of you. I'm here because of the one who sent me. And the very thing that feeds me is to do the will of the Lord, to do his will. If I don't get on a, a pat on the back, so a pat on the back feels good, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, for an approval from God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you can have a fear of the Lord, it won't matter what people say. It won't matter if, they, if, they, if, if you preach a message that, man, you poured your heart out all week and they just look back at you like a, like a, like a baby calf looking at a brand new fence. You know what I mean? Sometimes, we have weeks like that sometimes. I don't typically tell you about it, (laughs) but I want you to know that that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking to do the will of God. And if I will speak the truth and not worry and not rely on my own strength, my own ability, then people's lives are going to get transformed because I'm relying on God, on his good news, on his message In, in and of myself. If I'm preaching my message, what, what, what I want and my desires, then we're all in trouble. No one's changing. We're just going to come back to church every single week, needing more, needing more, wanting to be fed. But when we begin to have the, a fear of the Lord, we begin to walk in his wisdom. It's, we get to a point in a place where, man, how can I be a part of this feeding thing? Understand that the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. I want to be a laborer. When I stand before God, I want him to say, well, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I-, I wasn't waiting for you to realize that God's not waiting or we're not waiting on God. We're not waiting on a move of God's spirit. His spirit is moving. He's waiting on us. He's waiting on you. Whom or what shall we fear? The fear of the Lord is the foundation or the beginning of what? Someone say wisdom. Wisdom. I want to show you in Matthew 10, 28. Are you getting anything this morning? Amen. Thank you, Robert. Matthew 10, 28. These are the words of Jesus. It's almost like he's echoing uh, the proverb. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's sending them out to, to share and to, to, to spread to others and to announce that the kingdom of heaven is near. Or the, the kingdom of heaven is coming. It's on its way. It's, it's here. <laughs> and in verse 26, he says, but don't be afraid of those who threaten you. He, someone say, don't be, don't be afraid. In 28, he says, don't be afraid again of those who want to kill your body. Why not, Jesus? Because they cannot touch your soul. 
the wisdom of, of, of the, the world, the wisdom of man, the wisdom of our own flesh is going to do everything it can to, to feed the flesh. But to understand and to realize that all of this is temporary. And we cannot allow the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the flesh to seep into the church to make us think that temporary things are going to go with us beyond this life. To be so caught up with the temporary things that we put God on the, on the, on the back burner, let him simmer while we, do, while we do all of our stuff, we get all messed up in our own lives, our relationships, and then we, we come back to God. <laughs> What's cool about God is he, he's into like umpteen chances. Like how, if, you, if you still got blood in your, flowing through your veins, you got oxygen in your lungs, he's still, he's still got mercy for you. And so even though some have put God on the back burner and they come back to him when maybe they've been all used up, I'm telling you, whatever you give to God, he will use it and he will cause it to come to life. But just imagine if we didn't put God on the back burner, we, we put, we put God on the front, like the, what, the big burner. What is that? What is the big burner called? Is it called the big burner? The what? All right. The power burner. That, that's even more relevant, right? <laughs> Put God on the power burner. Right, just right up front. And just let him use us the way that he wants. To allow his will, his purpose, and his plan to be fulfilled in the here, in the now. And I feel, I feel like God, I don't feel like, I, I hear God calling soldiers... Who are, who are willing and ready to go out into the battlefield, not to hurt people, but to resurrect people, to bring people up and out of the darkness and into the light of our God so that they too can have a fear of the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. So don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. He says, fear only who? These are the words of Jesus. He says, fear only God. And that word fear, it means to reverently and worshipfully honor and respect God. And you can tell people who have this, this, this fear of the Lord because they listen to what God says and they do it. People who don't fear the Lord, they're like, ah, God will understand. And they sit back on the recliner and just, I'll let you guys do it. You know, there, there's plenty of workers what did Jesus say? That the, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are what? Few. Laborers are few. So get on the field. Get out on the ball game and begin to, to go to work for the Lord. Not worrying and not fearing what, what might happen to you or what, might, what people might say. But to put your trust in the hands of God, realizing that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is holding you securely. And he's not going to let you go. And if you will follow him, his favor will follow you. It's not a thing of where you're looking for God's favor or you're, you're scratching and scraping for, for the anointing of God. But if you, will, if you will hang out under the shadow of the Almighty, his favor will follow you. It'll chase you down. It'll slap you upside the head in a good way. His anointing, his wisdom. Because we know that the fear of the Lord is the foundation or the beginning of wisdom. He says, fear only God who can destroy, who is the only one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So this is important for us to know, to fear the Lord. And it's not, we're not afraid of God. It's a, it's a worshipful a reverence for God, knowing who he is. We have this awareness of who he is. He's not God. He doesn't owe me anything. If anything, I owe him everything. Even though he gave me everything. Through, he bankrupted heaven for our sake, right? He gave up his son to die for us, to give his life so that we wouldn't have to live broken. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so many of us, we have, we have that experience. We know what that experience is all about. But Jesus said that I have come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. In verse 32 in that, I don't know if you have that media team, 
But verse 32, I just want to end with this. I had so much more, but we're, good thing that, that uh, we're, we've, got, we've got some time with each other, right? You're going to be here next week. Verse 32, everyone who acknowledges me, this is Jesus. Actually, let's back up to 31. He says, so don't be afraid. I just wanted you to hear him say it again. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So when you acknowledge God, your, your name is spoken in heaven. You are acknowledged before the Father. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And we're going to stop right there. Can I hear someone say, whom shall I fear? fear? Would you say with me one more time, would you say, the fear of the Lord Lord. is the foundation of wisdom. wisdom. 